Well, thanks. That was a really nice introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about entomology situation in hemp and um, I, I've limited this talk today. I, I've focused it exclusively on corn earworm management in uh, CBD hemp production because in my experience that has been the number one issue in this state. It's a huge challenge to manage this pest outdoors. Um, but again, this talk is very targeted today and it's kind of in a story format. I'm kind of telling you what we've done and where we still have to go with it. So you're kind of in the loop of the, the full aspect of the situation. Um, but with that said, you know, I have worked with other species of pests in this crop. And if you've got questions about indoor production or another type of pest that's not corn earworm, please email me. I'm more than happy to help. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat when it, when I finish. But again, this talk is targeted today. So I I hope that it's still going to help most of you, but I'm just kind of letting you know where I'm coming from today. So let's get to it. Corn earworm, like I said, it's the number one pest of hemp grown outdoors everywhere. It's definitely our biggest insect pest problem here. Um, you know, it feeds on leaves a little bit, but it mainly gets in the buds, it chews, and it causes all kinds of problems for you. Sometimes these worms are really tough to see because like in the photo on the left, they kind of nestle within the bud material and sometimes they're green. So they camouflage really well. Um, in addition to feeding on buds though, they can also chew on young plant material and clip the stems like in the photo on the right, which is pretty not enjoyable. You don't want to see this happening. As most of you likely know, um, the biggest issue and the biggest concern for you as a producer with this insect is that it its feeding kind of leads to bud rot. So it doesn't directly cause this bud rot. What happens is that the worm comes in, chews on this bud material. It causes these feeding wounds, uh, which allows environmental pathogens to invade this tissue. And then you get this nasty, ugly, rotted material within the bud. So again, they're not directly causing this. It's kind of a secondary thing that's happening, but it's a huge problem. Um, and it's definitely coming from corn earworm feeding. So, you know, I, I want to make a comment to you really quickly. Um, a big part of our work as entomologists is establishing economic thresholds. So it's all about money and we want to prevent money loss for you growing your crop. You know, but unfortunately, a really huge issue in the way of us figuring out this information in hemp is that, as you know, the market is so unstable right now. The value of this crop varies from year to year. The value of the material that you're selling, whether it's biomass or whether it's raw smokable material, it's fluctuating and it's going to make a difference in how much damage you might be willing to tolerate in the field. Um, so again, just this comment to let you know, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the way of us establishing these economic thresholds in hemp. Um, you know, we, these are well established in other crops because we've had years, you know, like a hundred years or more to study corn and soybeans, but we don't have that time spent yet with hemp. It's a new crop. It's new to you. Um, it's really new to us as researchers. We just don't have the time and the years of research put in just yet. So that's kind of a disclaimer, letting you know um, what's in the way of a successful pest management plan. But there are a lot of steps that I've identified, or you know, me and my advisor um, as scientists within this field, there are a lot of things that need to happen in order for us to be able to successfully manage this pest in this crop. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what we've done so far, and then I'm gonna tell you what still needs to be done. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So you know, first and foremost, we need to determine the pest impacts of this pest in this crop system. Um, so to assess this, we worked with entomologists, um, you know, ourselves in Virginia, plus entomologists in other states within this region to see what corn earworm damage looks like in this crop in the field. Um, so we sampled 30 buds weekly in outdoor fields um, beginning at flowering. I know 30 doesn't sound like a lot, but it's just a standardized number that we used in each field so we could compare our results from site to site. What we found was throughout the whole season that peak larval counts in hemp 
in your hemp buds occurred in September at all locations. So you can expect a really high influx of larval corn earworm in September in Virginia. The peak larval count was around seven larvae per 30 buds, which again doesn't sound like a lot, but it is because these things are so voracious, they can cause massive amounts of damage. Um, that's that's kind of what we're working with. So, you know, again, I'm talking about assessing pest damage. To, so to see what was going on, we established this rating scale of what corn earworm damage might look like to buds. Um, to explain this to you, um, we just try to keep it simple. That's why it's zero to three. Um, so on the scale, zero meant no damage and three was the worst, meaning that there was damage to 50% or more of the bud, meaning that it was not marketable as smokable material and it's pretty slimly marketable as biomass. Um, in between the extremes, you know, a rating of one meant that it was a little bit of damage, um, but it was still marketable. You could easily pick it out. Um, a rating of two meant that there was damage to less than 50% of the bud, but it was still unmarketable. So that's where my uh, the numbers for my next slide are going to come in. So at the end of the season, we assessed damage to buds by using this rating scale. And what we found was that, um, um, I'm sorry, give me a second, um, I'm sorry or sorry, what we found was that um, an average of 2.5 or so larvae per 30 buds, so about one corn earworm per 10 buds, was going to lead to unacceptable crop damage at the end of the season. Um, so the, the threshold here, you know, even though we haven't established a threshold yet, what we're seeing is that very low numbers of earworms can lead to pretty significant damage in the crop. So this pest is management worthy. We've got to figure out ways to manage it. The next step in this story is we need to develop effective monitoring tools um, and methods in which we can monitor. So if you've grown corn or soybeans or you're just familiar with agriculture in general, you've probably heard of corn earworm being a pest in other crop systems and you might be aware of these white mesh traps that are placed on field edges to monitor the adult form of this insect. So, you know, we thought it'd be really great if we could use these traps to monitor this insect in hemp. Um, but what we're finding, though, is that it's that's not really working out for hemp. We're, we're not sure of the reason yet, but it's not really working in hemp. Based on data collection from Virginia and those states that I mentioned earlier, we're not able to find a a relationship between moths caught in these traps and number of worms on plants in the field. So unfortunately, at least at this time, these traps aren't really helping us predict corn earworm infestation in hemp. Um, we, you know, what we're thinking it's really coming down to is wind patterns surrounding crop complexes, um, and whether this insect actually likes hemp more than other agronomic crops. You know, it, it seems likely that if corn were planted next to hemp, that might elevate the numbers of corn earworm in your hemp crop or in the vicinity of the field, but we don't have data to be able to reliably say that. So the takeaway right here is that these traps aren't really the best method right now, which is unfortunate, um, but other methods are going to be have are going to have to be explored in the future. All right, so the next and potentially the most helpful information for you today is um, exploring efficacious insecticide options. So, you know, we're at a point with this crop where certain chemicals are allowed for use in hemp, whether that means they're directly stated on the label, you know, the word hemp is on the label, or the label is broad enough that it doesn't exclude application to hemp. So before I tell you about the field trial, I want to tell you about some lab studies with earworm. Um, these are some different insecticides here. Um, I've got a key in the gray bar on the bottom that lets you know the active ingredient. Um, of greatest interest to you on this slide is going to be the blue bars, which are the BT products. So for what it's worth, in a lab setting, BT is not working that well. Um, with four days of exposure to these products in the lab, meaning that the worm got a diet of 
hemp exclusively treated with these products. It had no other choice. It had to feed on this or die. Um, the best BT product gave just about 70% mortality after four days, which might be okay, you know, considering we don't have that much to work with, but it's not really that good. Um, especially when compared to this black bar here, which is the conventional standard, you cannot use in trust on hemp, but we always put it in these trials to see how well these biological products hold up. Um, and it, it's okay. The BT products are okay, but they're not that great. Um, in a separate lab trial, we tested more BT products. Um, um, a pyganic, which the active ingredient is pyrethrin, and then the conventional standard, which is um, the black bar. Again, in this second trial, uh, Dr. Fike, could you mute everyone I'm hearing some noise? Um, okay, there we go. Um, we saw, again, moderate efficacy from these BT products, but it's around 70 to 75 percent at best, which is OK, but it's not that great. Um, so this gives you a picture of how well these hold up in a lab environment, which is a best case scenario. It's a little different in the field. Um, so last year, 2020, I conducted a larger scale field trial at Blackstone. Um, with many of these same insecticides. So again, this was at the Southern Piedmont AREC. That's where the orange star is on the map. Um, transplanted hemp seedlings on uh, July 2nd, 2020. I initiated these um, insecticide sprays for corn earworm at flowering because that's when this insect is in the crop and that's when you're gonna have to start worrying about managing this pest. Um, these plots were treated three times throughout September. And to get the numbers that I'm sharing with you, I sampled 10 buds per plot and recorded the number of earworms that were present. So just to give you an idea, this is what the field plot looks like. Probably looks a lot like your own hemp plots if they're grown outdoors. So here are the data. I'm going to, this is, there's a lot of treatments. I know it looks like a lot, but I'm going to walk you through these and tell you what this means. So again, um, these numbers here were a cumulative number of corn earworms um, throughout the duration of the trial. And I got these numbers by counting the number of worms on 10 buds in a research plot. Again, on, in the gray bar on the bottom of the slide, I've got a color legend to help you understand the active ingredients in these products that were tested. So first off, this dotted bar or dotted line here shows you the number of worms in the untreated control plot, which this is about the number of worms you could expect if you didn't use any insecticide on your plot. So next, um, the active ingredient in Pyganic is pyrethrins. Um, for the rec, these aren't allowed for use in hemp, but they are a, an organic product. So we just wanted to test efficacy here. But what we found was that, you know, levels of worms in the pyganic plots were higher than the untreated plots. So even if you could use that, you don't want to use it. Um, what we're figuring is that this product is breaking down in the sunlight and it's probably also killing off natural enemy insects, which would help manage corn earworm numbers. So it's not allowed, but even if it was, don't use it. Um, the, in the black bars, these are the kind of the industry standard for earworm management and other crops like corn or soybeans. They work well. They're tried and true. These are not allowed for use on hemp either, but I'm putting it in here so you can see um, the comparison to the other biological products that we tested. All right, so the bars in green, these all are a biological insecticide and the active ingredient is called a nucleopolyhedrovirus, which is a big word, um, but just think of it as a virus. The specific virus in this product um, attacks corn earworm exclusively. So, you know, the numbers here, they're not significantly, you know, statistically significant, significantly different from some of these other treatments, but there's a noticeable reduction in the number of earworms in plots treated with this virus product. The beauty of this virus product is that it's allowed for use in hemp. So the trade names are Helogen and Gemstar. 
again, you're not going to get 100% control here, but it's allowed. Hemp is on the label. So this is something you should consider if you're looking to manage corn earworm in your hemp. Lastly, um, for whatever reason, this treatment combination of Gemstar, which is the NPV or the virus, um, plus Bottega, which is a fun, or I'm sorry, a bacteria that affects insects, it worked the best. Um, both of these products are allowed in hemp as well. Again, I don't know the real reason why this worked so well, but I'm sharing these data with you. So that's that for the insecticide trial. We can talk about that more after my presentation if there are questions. Um, for the, the last couple things, these are still some things that we need to do. I'm just kind of presenting it to you to let you know where we are with um, a pest management plan for this, for corn earworm and hemp. So, you know, there are biological control agents or beneficial insects that are out in our plots. We just don't know how well these manage worms. We need to do more research in order to figure that out. Um, next, you know, cultural control is another tactic. Um, and, you know, one thing we're really interested in, and so are other entomologists in the United States, you know, we think there are varietal differences in pest susceptibility. And, you know, maybe some of these varieties are a little more resistant to certain pests, but these have not been evaluated yet. Um, I don't have data. I'm just telling you this is something that we plan to do and that needs to be done in the future. Another tactic you might have thought of is trap cropping. Um, I think it could work in hemp. I think there are crops that might be more attractive to earworms than hemp. But the problem here is, you know, as I mentioned previously, the economics of this crop are so unstable that you don't want to plant a crop around hemp that costs more to produce than, you know, the money you can make on hemp. So that's the problem. Um, this needs more research and the economics need to be more stable in order for us to get some solid answers with this. Um, you know, a, a next step is, you know, I have presented to you the data on these conventional products in um, managing corn earworm and hemp, but the problem is that they're not allowed for use because hemp's not on the label. And the problem with that is that we need a lot more research with these products. Um, there are residue concerns, you know, hemp is a smokable product. So there's a lot of different studies that will need to occur in order for these more elite products to get registered. And then lastly, uh, Michael mentioned it earlier, but it is really hard for us to get funding to do this research, which is unfortunate because you all need help. You all need answers about pest management and we're doing the best we can on a little bit of funding. So there's a lot of things that need to happen in order for this pest management plan to be really robust and to work really well. But, you know, for right now, it's it's going to remain a challenge for the coming years. Um, but your takeaway from me today, the at this time, the best option for management of corn earworm and hemp is scouting regularly. And once you see larvae in your plants, you're going to have to initiate control measures. And your best bet is to use these virus insecticides as right now they're allowed in hemp and they offer the highest level of corn earworm suppression. So that's all I have, but just be optimistic that, you know, research is continuing. We're trying to do what we can to help you and give you answers. We just don't have them yet.